We're continuing our series on spiritual warfare. Can't help but thinking that um, some of what just happened again last Sunday is about this whole warfare battle that we're all facing. Evil is so prevalent in our world and doing nasty. Thank you, sir. Doing nasty. Na oh, yeah, this might take us a few minutes, too. Anybody want to watch the football game? Which one? <laughs> oh my goodness. It's trying to update my software. <laughs> that is not, I just told it not to, and it still wants to. That's not a good thing. <laughs> How many of you would like to have a guest come stay with you at your house? A stranger, a dirty person, a nasty person, a mean-spirited person, a person who is going to rob you, and he promises to do that before he ever gets there, a, prom a person who's going to lie to you, cheat you, try to mess up everything he can in your home. How would you like to have them? Now, now who still has their hand up? I didn't hear you. Yeah. Charlotte, you want that person to come live with you? No, this is a way worse than a bad parent. This is a, this is a person who you don't know, who, but they know all, of, all kinds of things about you. This is a person who so despises you that he really wants to ruin everything about you. Now, who here would say, yes, please come be my guest? And here's the sad thing is, way too many people in the body of Christ are inviting that guy to come and be a guest. And how do you do that? You do that by hanging on to resentment, bitterness, and unforgiveness. And the Word of God, you'll see it this morning, says that when we do that, when we hold on to bitterness and resentment, then we are actually giving a, f notice this, notice the word here, a foothold for Satan in our lives. A foothold. That's not just them walking by your house and throwing eggs at it. That's not just somebody walking in there when you're not there and trying to steal something from you. That's not just a friend who, uh, who kind of lied to you and took advantage of you and ripped you off. This is an enemy from that basically comes from the pit of hell and will return to the pit of hell. This enemy wants to destroy you. And notice the word says that we, with our bitterness and resentment, as we hold on to anger towards other people, we are giving that guy, Satan himself, a foothold. And if it's not Satan, because remember, how many of us have Satan tempting us? Probably none of us. Probably none of us. We have his minions, his lower, his lower demons and, and the, that, that are after us. And we have our own sin nature, our own flesh. And sometimes we're blaming Satan for something that we did ourselves. It wasn't Satan at all. It was simply my choice. But we are, notice, and let's, let's look at our text this morning. Because some of you are saying, yeah, right, Bill. I don't believe you. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses 26, and we'll go all the way to 32. Ephesians chapter 4. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. 
with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. I've been wondering where we are in the process. Where are you in the process? Are you bitter at what something, something that someone has done to you? And the fact is, is that there are a lot of wounded people, probably several of us here. We look back over experiences in our life, there's things that have deeply wounded us that we carry with us, that mark us and scar us from being abandoned as a child to abuse by a parent, drug addiction in the home, literal fits of rage and anger, or how about having been at the concert last Sunday night? There are many things that can cause us to hold on to bitterness and rage. Where are you? Are you at that place where you are bitter? You're holding on to the anger? And if so, then darkness is trying to strangle you. Maybe you've said, okay, God, I forgive this person. I, I'm no longer going to hold it against them. Uh, I've got to get rid of their garbage, and so I forgive them. But, but you haven't gotten reconciled yet. Maybe you never will get reconciled. Maybe that person that you're trying to forgive, that you're trying to get free from, has long since died, but they've left their wounds. And how can there ever be reconciliation? Because you cannot have them come to you and say, now I know the pain I caused you. Or are you at that place where it's simply easier to walk away than to resolve issues and feelings. Boy, this is something that happens way too often at the church. You, you, you don't like the way somebody behaves. You don't like their attitude or whatever it is. Something that you just, they just rub you wrong. It's obviously their fault, by the way. But it's, it's simply easier to walk away from them than to try to resolve issues, than to try to get closer, than to try to, to work through feelings. Or maybe you're at this place. The person you might be most troubled by is sitting in the chair that you're in right now. And you are struggling to accept and receive forgiveness. Where are you in the process? Galatians says that there are things that are, that are fighting us. And I want you to look. There's a, two pieces here in Galatians 5 um, that, that Galatians 5 will describe the sin nature and the garbage that's in all of us in one way or another. And then he's going to describe the fruit of the Spirit. Look at, listen to this comparison of these two. First, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, and there's all kinds of that, isn't there? I mean, there's many ways. Uh, I commit sexual immorality when I'm looking at porn instead of loving my bride. Uh, I, I commit sexual immorality by simply lusting at the person I'm seeing on the street. You see, sexual immorality has many different uh, pieces to it, uh, and, and there are all different types, but uh, he goes on. If that one's not enough, he goes to impurity and debauchery, behavior that's just outlandish, idolatry and witchcraft. Now, we have, in this country, that has become so intellectually minded, we have more witchcraft taking place today. It reminds me literally of Israel, who would, would worship God and all of a sudden then turn and worship all these other multitude of gods, have seances, talk to the dead, all that kind of stuff. And it's happening even by in government settings. He goes on. The acts of the flesh are obvious. And the next one he says is hatred. Hatred. You know what hatred is? 
It's not the opposite of love. Hatred is misdirected love. Hatred is a wounded love. Hatred comes because somebody has hurt you, because expectations weren't met. And now, out of your pain, you're holding something against them. You start to hate them. The opposite of love, by the way, is complacency. I don't care. Oh, you're sad? <laughs> I don't care. You're hurting today? I really don't care. That's the opposite of love. Galatians goes on, he lists discord, and he's not talking about music here, is he? And he's talking about the kind of strife that we have, and it can happen in the home. You know, too often it happens on Sunday morning on the way to worship. Have any of you never noticed that? Just trying to get ready <laughs> when the strife hits. Discord, jealousy, uh, you know, I, 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 and jealousy is built on what? I don't trust you. I don't trust other people. And so I start to get jealous of you and what, where you're at. Fits of rage. Have any of you been present? Maybe you were the person. Have any of you been present when somebody had a fit of rage, just got so bloody mad, they got out of control, <laughs> slamming their fists, throwing things across the room? Fits of rage. Incidentally, test something sometime. Some people think, you know, well, anger, it's one of those emotions I can't control. It just takes over me. It erupts, and I have nothing to do about it. But if somebody that they really care about, like a boss or somebody like that, suddenly called on the phone, guess what they would do? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> yes. Oh, so good. Thank you. Oh, I really appreciate that. Okay. Goodbye. <laughs> no, see, we can control it, can't we? <laughs> Fits of rage, selfish ambition, the self-centered heart, the person that's simply focused on themselves, dissensions, we get into disagreements, factions, and form sides against one another. If that's not our country today, wow. Envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. That is one serious warning that our behavior, our sin life, could actually and will actually keep us from eternal life. Unless we let Jesus pay the price. So, so Paul goes on, he says, but the fruit of the Spirit, he says, okay, there's the behaviors we want to try to avoid, and every single one of us has been vulnerable to one of them, okay? I, I, I know some of you are really goody two-shoes, not like some of the rest of us, but, but even in those of you who are really good, you've done stuff wrong. You've thought stuff, okay? You've got sin in your life. You've had it there, and there's probably still some things you don't do perfectly today, but the fruit of of the Spirit. And notice, folks, these, these are some of the most powerful weapons we have in our arsenal against Satan. Look at these things. And think of these now as, as weapons, not just fruit, because fruit kind of sounds weird, right? I mean, it's fruity, you know, like juicy fruit or something like that. No, no, this is, this is powerful, God-ordained weapons. is love. Sacrificing, giving up your stuff, talking about joy, a joy that comes even to bring up all kinds of fights. Joy is greater than happiness, which is common in the hope that fills you up. Peace, and the sort of things that will come out of all kinds of different things. Forbearance, well, that's what you need to have other people to be forbearing. So you never go back and forth with that forbearance. that says, don't ever pray for patience. Have you ever heard somebody say that? Yeah. Don't pray for patience. And they can't do it like, you know, with fear and trembling, you know. Because if you pray for patience, you're going to get trials and things are going to go bad for you and it's going to be really hard. So don't pray for patience. Guess what? <laughs> trials are coming whether you pray for patience or not. <laughs> Wouldn't it be wise to ask God for patience 
so that you have the tools to stand against the trials. Don't give in to that. You don't realize how many lies we've listened to that are from darkness. Don't listen. Pray for the patience. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Whoops. Somebody just pushed the button. I wonder who that was. <sighs> patience, kindness. Oh, my one of the beautiful things that was happening there as people were being wounded and suffering and dying there was a spirit of kindness that came upon the, all kinds of people as they tried to take care of one another love, joy, peace, patience kindness, goodness to be good hearted to, to really care about others goodness, faithfulness I'm trustworthy, I'm dependable Gentleness. This one is really interesting for the topic this morning because gentleness, the, the word means, the root of it is anger, strength, power, under control. You got the button there for the atomic bomb. <laughs> you don't really want an angry person controlling it, do you? <laughs> you want somebody who is gentle, or the other word is meek who has their anger, their strength, their power under control. They're not going to do it as a reaction. They're not going to push that button out of emotion. And, and we just use the atomic button, but what about, what about in our relationships with one another? We want somebody who's, who's strong and powerful and could, could, what, destroy something, and yet they take their anger and their strength and their power. It's under control, and that's meekness. That's gentleness. And finally the word that kind of roots all these together is self-control. Against such things there is no law. Cool. There is no restriction to the use of those fruit. There is no law against them. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That was the first paragraph. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. So what's warring in you? James said, what causes fights and quarrels among you? And then he answers it. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? He says, you know, why are you getting into arguments? Why are you getting into fights with other people? And then he answers, it's their fault because of what they're doing wrong. And that's not what he said, is it? He said, don't they come from your desires that are battling within? You think about it, when you've gotten angry, there's something that, some unmet expectation, something that's going on inside there that you're fighting, and that anger is starting to erupt. You see, well, Ephesians is, is a book that's really about the body of Christ and the importance and the value of the body of Christ taking care of one another. We have this, kind of, this responsibility and as well as this privilege to do what happened out there that in Las Vegas when somebody else is hurting to come alongside of them. To, when people are coming home here and they're grieving, we need to go and grieve with them. The body of Christ ought to be there in the, the most difficult times, the most painful times. And the beautiful thing is if you look at every tragedy that takes place, who shows up on the scene? Samaritan's Purse, World Vision, Christian churches, God's people show up. Why? Because they understand the value of the body. And Ephesians is all about the body. But the problem is when we give in to anger and resentment, that starts to harm the body. And in fact, one person said when we get resentful, we're actually eating up the body. Doesn't that... Uh, none of you understand anger because you haven't felt it. I can just tell you from personal experience that when I get angry, I feel ripped up from the inside out. The, the stress, the pain, just the, 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 the emotional trauma going on inside of me, the churning, the not being able to stop thinking, all that just wrestles with inside of me. And what's it doing? What is anger doing to me? It's eating up my body. Neil Anderson, who has done an incredible work on you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. He's the, the whole ministry on setting people free. He quotes um, Frederick Buechner, great theologian, liberal theologian. He says, of the seven deadly sins, anger is possibly the most fun. What? To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, 
to savor to the last toothsome morsel both the pain you were given and the pain you are giving back. In many ways, is it, it is as a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback is that what you are wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton is the feast in you. Hebrews says we have a high priest who can sympathize with us. First Peter says that Jesus did not build resentment and that neither should we. He's able to sympathize with us because he understood. What did he call those Pharisees? Let's see. I think this was a word of praise. You brood of vipers. You hypocrites. I think, are those nice words? They were the words of a man with his anger under control. One day he goes to the temple. Actually, there's two different accounts of this. And one of the ones that I really appreciate is the one where it says that he sits down as he's standing there and he sees what's happening and they're in the outer courtyard, remember, where the Gentiles are, where the foreigners are supposed to be coming to get to know God. And they're out there selling all kinds of things and ripping off people. They're selling a dove that they sold three times already that day. And by the way, it was a dove that some other foreigner brought. And they're just totally ripping off people. And he sees all this. He sees this thievery. He sees this, this, this selfish game that these guys are all after. And it's, uh, that the, the word says he sits down and he braids a whip. Now, I don't know about you, but when I get really angry, I would not be able to knit or crochet. Sorry, Ashley, I don't know where you are. Okay, I couldn't do it, all right? Yeah. Okay, I'm angry. Yes, I'm going to thread the needles here, and I'm going to crochet this. No, I'm throwing those needles across the room if I'm that angry. I mean, I'm not going to have the kind of... And do, but Jesus sits down with his anger, his strength, his power under control, and he braids a whip. He uses it to clear out the animals. He throws the tables over all this time under control. Is he angry? Yes. And how did, how did Paul start Ephesians 4? In your anger, do not sin. In your anger, do not sin. Anderson goes on. <laughs> I got to turn the volume off now. There's a pass that just got intercepted. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sheepers. Neil Anderson talks about 12 steps to forgiveness. He says, forgiveness is what sets us free from the past. What is to be gained in forgiving is freedom. You don't heal in order to forgive. You forgive in order to heal. You don't heal in order to, you don't heal in order to forgive. You forgive in order to heal. You don't forgive others for their sake. You do it for your sake. Anderson asks a great question. Is unforgiveness an option? He then quotes an article in Parade Magazine. While we may admire those who can find forgiveness in their hearts, forgiveness may not always be the answer. This is a Parade Magazine. Okay, just, you know, let me repeat that. This is not what I'm recommending. But Andrew Vox, a writer and attorney who represents abused children, has noted, a particularly pernicious myth for victims of abuse is that healing requires forgiveness of the abuser. This only leads to further victimization, he added, and there are some things that cannot be and should not e ever be forgiven. As I Ellie Weasel, the Nobel laureate and Holocaust survivor said in a prayer at the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, God of forgiveness, do not forgive those murderers of Jewish children here. And Anderson responds, Forgiveness does not mean tolerating sin and placing oneself back under the power of an abuser. God never tolerates sin, and neither should we. But, you, but Paul said, forgive as Christ forgave you. And who does Christ forgive? But doesn't he forgive all sinners? Didn't he die even before we... And take note. Didn't he die and forgive us before we changed? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't that in the word of God? Colossians speaks to this when it says, Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 and following. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature 
sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. That is good news, by the way, kids. Did you hear it? The good news? You used to walk in these ways. You're no longer that way because Jesus Christ has changed you. And even though you used to walk in that way, Jesus Christ has forgiven you and made you into a new person. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Those kind of all go together, don't they? You get angry at somebody, and pretty soon that anger starts building, and it turns into rage, and you're throwing things. And now when you're throwing things, you also use all kinds of things that slander and say bad things about that other person, and you throw out statements about them that you know aren't true, but you know it's going to hurt them, and so you continue to say it. And what's that going to happen? And you're harming, and says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Charles Stanley, a great preacher, talks about what forgiveness is. He says, for He says, forgiveness is the act of setting someone free from an obligation resulting from a wrong done against you. For example, a debt is forgiven when you free the offender of his responsibility to pay back what he owes you. True forgiveness, then, involves three elements, in all, all of which are necessary. An injury, a debt resulting from the injury, and a cancellation of the debt. All three have to be there in order for there to be forgiveness. But let's talk a little bit about what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not justifying, understanding, or explaining why the person acted towards you as he or she did. It's not saying, oh, yeah, it's okay, you know. Yeah, that person abused me, but, you know, but they were abused, so therefore it makes it okay. Uh Uh-uh. It's not justifying it. It's not just forgetting about the offense and trusting time to take care of it. In fact, too many people think, you know, well, if I forgive, do I have to forget it? The fact is you better not. I'll come back to that. Forgiveness is not asking God to forgive the person who hurt you. Now, there are some times that you may have to literally say, though, God, I can't do this. God, would you do it through me? You know, somebody that's been sexually abused, assaulted as a child by an adult, maybe violently treated, We cannot downplay how significant that horror was. And that person may simply say, God, I can't do it, but I know that if I don't, it's going to continue to haunt me. They've gone on. They've forgotten. They may not even remember what they did. They may even be dead by now, yet it still haunts me. I've got to let go. Jesus, help me. Forgiveness is not asking God to forgive you for being angry or resentful against the person who offended you. God, I'm so ticked at what they did to me. That guy that just cut me off, I'm so ticked at him. It's it's not saying, God, forgive me for being ticked right there in that moment. Now, if you speed up and try to run him over, now you're going to need some forgiveness, right? (laughs) Plus a bail to get out of jail. And forgiveness is not annoying that you were really hurt. After all, there are others who have suffered more. It's not saying, you know, oh, I, didn't, I, I, wasn't, I, I wasn't really hurt. Besides others have gone through so much more. See, that's downplaying it. That's saying, no, that it wasn't real pain when it was. So I have a question. Here's, here's a quiz for you. Are you ready? Five questions. True or false? You ready? Five questions. Number one, a person should not be forgiven until they ask for it. True or false? Number two, Forgiveness includes minimizing the offense and the pain that was caused. Yeah, it wasn't that bad. Number three, forgiveness includes restoring trust and reuniting a relationship. False. Reconciliation happens when that other person understands the pain they caused you. 
trust has to be built, rebuilt over time, and it won't happen fast. Four, you haven't really forgiven until you've forgotten the offense. Five, when I see someone else hurt, then it is my duty to forgive the offender. Can any of us forgive the shooters at uh, Sandy Hook Elementary School? No way. Can any of us forgive this man who did this evil thing in Las Vegas? No, we can't. Now, if he shot at you or killed somebody you love or wounded somebody that was in your family and you really felt their pain and you're trying to help them, now, could you then be a person to forgive them? Only because he had done it to you. But I can't forgive somebody else for what they did to someone else. Only Jesus can do that. See, forgiveness is our part in reconciliation. If somebody's wronged us, forgiveness is our part. But for a relationship to be restored, the offender I got three things the offender has to do. If I've been wronged, my part in reconciliation, and by the way, again, I keep reminding us, forgiveness helps me. It's not for them. Forgiveness sets me free. It's not about setting them free. There's three things that a person has to do in order for there to be reconciliation. Number one, they got to demonstrate genuine repentance. If somebody's really wronged you, Oh, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again. Please forgive me. No. I mean, really, that, that ha habitual sin the person is doing, the, the adulterer who comes back and says, Oh, honey, but I still love you. Uh, I'll never do that again. You know, please, honey, please, please, don't leave me. Please forgive me. Uh, no. No, I'm going to forgive because of what I need to do inside, but I'm not going to let that person, because that's not repentance, is it? That's simply just a little kid trying to get out of trouble and try to avoid the punishment. So number one, got to demonstrate genuine repentance. They have to show that they genuinely are sorry before the relationship can start to rebuild. Genuine repentance, and that means a ch there's got to be an actual change in their lifestyle. Number two, they have to make restitution when possible. And sometimes that can't happen. There may not be any way that you can make restitution, but they ought to try, whenever possible, make restitution for the damage that they've done. And number three, the offender must rebuild your trust by proving that they have changed over time. Now, isn't that interesting? But you take those three again, and you look at them personally with your relationship with Jesus. In order for you to be reconciled to Christ, in order for you to have a changed life, don't you have to do these three things too? Demonstrate genuine repentance, Make restitution and rebuild your trust. How are you going to make restitution with Christ? You're going to have to let him pay the price with his blood. And then you've got to build trust by how you change your lifestyle. Here's a question I have for you today. Who makes you mad? Everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Charlotte. Me too. <laughs> think it. Think who who are some of the, the people that really make you mad, okay? The, the, and you don't have to tell out loud at the moment. Hebrews twelve fifteen says, See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Watch out, because who's ever making you mad, you're vulnerable to a bitter root starting to grow inside of you. Have you been hurt by somebody? Most of us have. Most have been hurt by somebody that we uh, loved, cared about, was important to us. You know, the strangers kind of don't affect us as much as the people we know. So who are you angry at? And, and who do you need to forgive? Are you angry with God? One of my friends who had been sexually assaulted by her father as a little, little, little girl. I mean, sexual assault went on for years. Eventually, uh, she became a prostitute. Um, she had a man who, who supposedly loved her as a teen and raped her. Um, 
later he then got her pregnant multiple times and every time she'd get pregnant they'd go to the abortion clinic and they would they would sacrifice the baby to Satan and I'm not just using that in figurative language they actually would have a spiritual service to sacrifice and use the blood from the infant that had been aborted as worship for Satan And do you know who she was angry most at? God, why didn't he protect me? God, where were you? And you know the second person she was most angry at? Mom. Mom who hadn't done the abuse. But mom must have somehow known. How could mom have allowed all these things to happen? How could mom not have been more aware? Notice, who are you angry at? It could be somebody like God. It could be somebody like the person who you thought was your, your confidant, the person that you cared most about. It could be even like your mom. I don't know. Con congregation like this, it's very probable that somebody here has been abused. Are you angry at your abuser? A lot of people have issues with mom or dad. Too many people have dad issues. Are you angry with your parents? Things that happened between you and they, maybe even decades ago. Let me just remind you of some dangerous things about anger. Proverbs 29, 11 says, A fool always loses its temper, but a wise man holds it back. Proverbs 12, 16, A fool shows his annoyance at once, but a prudent man overlooks an insult. Proverbs 14, 29, He who is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who is quick-tempered accepts, exalts folly. Proverbs 22, 24, 25. Do not associate with a man given to anger or go with a hot-tempered man or you will learn his ways and find a snare for yourself. You ever been around somebody who's really angry? They start rubbing off on you. Have you noticed? Proverbs 19, 19. A man of great anger will bear the penalty for if you rescue him, you will only have to do it again and again and again. Do you really want, do you really want Satan to live in your home. Get rid of all bitterness. I can't forget. Then ask God to use it for good in your life. You don't have to forget. That's not true. But ask God to help you let go of the bitterness so you can let go of the anger. And here's one, relinquish your right to get even. Okay, I want it. <laughs> Vengeance, yes, I want them to suffer. But relinquish that right, give it back to Jesus. Nelson Mandela, you, does everyone know who Nelson Mandela was? Somebody tell the, the kids, okay? <laughs> you, know, you may have to fill that in, you know abused in prison because he was a black man speaking against the injustices by the whites in South Africa. Eventually released from prison, becomes the prime minister of South Africa. Amazing story. Mandela said, people must learn to hate, and if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. Now, he's not saying you should learn to hate. He's just saying it's something, you, it's something just that, that happens. People learn to hate. It's not something that they, grew, they were born with. People learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, then they can also be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. As I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, this is the day he was leaving prison, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. Resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. You will achieve more in this world through acts of mercy than you will through acts of retribution. Folks, we can't go back, can we? But we also shouldn't stay where we're at if we're in unforgiveness. We've got to go forward. And forgiveness is God's means of letting go of the past and starting to move forward. I want to pray a prayer for you. And it's a prayer that Rick Warren prayed at the end of a message on forgiveness. Before I pray that prayer, I want to ask you, you need to let go of someone else's garbage. 
Do, do you have the image? We did this one Sunday. I brought up a bag of yucky, stinky garbage. When you are holding on to someone else's sin, you're holding on to their garbage. You're carrying around their smelly stuff because you're saying, I, I, I just can't let go. I can't forgive. I'm going to resent. I'm going to be angry. And, that's, and you're carrying their nasty stuff. When you forgive, you're saying, I'm going to drop their garbage and no longer hold on to it. Do you need to get rid of someone else's garbage? Are you carrying the stinky sin that someone else committed? They've forgotten it long ago. They're not focused there at all. And yet, you're still carrying it. It's time to throw it away. And by the way, this could be the most powerful spiritual weapon that God has given to us ever. The weapon of forgiveness. So would you pray? I'm going to pray Rick Warren's prayer. Would you pray this prayer of release and renewal and restoration and forgiveness? Would you let it go right now? I want you to think of that person who hurt you most. Now pray this. And you can do this silently. Dear God, you know how I've carried unforgiveness in my heart. I've held on to hurts and memories. And I have secretly wanted to get even. But today, I want to let it go. I want to get on with your plan for my life. So in spite of how I feel, I want to do the right thing. Today, right now, I forgive. Can you fill in the blank there? Who do you need to forgive? Say it to Jesus today. I forgive them. I relinquish my right to get even. Then name that person again. I let go of my right to get even. I pray you would work in their life. Oh, wow. And I commit to continuing to forgive them until I no longer feel the desire to seek revenge. I wonder why Peter was told, forgive 70 times 7, because maybe he had to keep doing it until he could actually do it. Jesus Christ, please replace my hurt with your peace and fill my life with your love. In your name I pray.